choose your clothing the way you would choose your friends. In both cases, choose that which improves you and which would give you confidence standing in the presence of God. Good friends would never embarrass you, demean you, or exploit you, and neither should your clothing. Please be more accepting of yourselves, including your body shape and style, with a little less longing to look like someone else. You can't live your life worrying that the world is staring at you. They are not. And when you let people's opinions make you self-conscious, you give away your power. The key to feeling confident is to always listen to your inner self, the real you. And in the kingdom of God, the real you is more precious than rubies. You are bombarded in movies, television, fashion magazines, and advertisements with the message that looks are everything. The pitch is, if your looks are good enough, your life will be glamorous and you will be happy and popular. That kind of pressure is immense in the teenage years, to say nothing of later womanhood. In too many cases, too much is being done to the human body to meet just such a fictional, to say nothing of superficial, standard. In terms of preoccupation with self and a fixation on the physical, this is more than social insanity. It is spiritually destructive, and it accounts for much of the unhappiness that women, including young women, face in the modern world. And if adults are preoccupied with appearance, tucking and nipping and implanting and remodeling everything that can be remodeled, those pressures and anxieties will certainly seep through to children. At some point, the problem becomes what the Book of Mormon called vain imagination. And in secular society, both vanity and imagination run wild. One would truly need a great and spacious makeup kit to compete with beauty as portrayed in media all around us. Yet at the end of the day, there would still be those in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers, as Lehi said, because however much one tries in the world of glamour and fashion, it will never be enough. Hi, it's Ben from the Hope in Christ podcast. And we're studying the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and this scripture highlight is from chapters 3 and 5. Think for a minute, what is our natural inclination when we do something wrong? Even from the days of Adam and Eve, when they were found naked in the Garden of Eden, people have sought to hide their sins. But in Isaiah chapter 3, the Lord teaches us something about trying to hide our sins. He said, The show of their countenance doth witness against them and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with them, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. That verse is fascinating. Not only does it talk about how what we do will come back to us, But along with a few verses from the New Testament, Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants, this verse alludes to the idea that everything we do, whether it's righteous or evil, is recorded in our body and reflected in our countenance. Listen to these words from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. In a real, though figurative sense, the Book of Life is the record of the acts of men as such record is written in their own bodies. It is the record engraven on the very bones, sinews, and flesh of the mortal body. That is, every thought, word, and deed has an effect on the human body. All these leave their marks. And listen to these words from President John Taylor. I could show you upon scientific principles that man himself is a self-registering machine. His eyes, his ears, his nose, the touch, the taste, and all the various senses of the body are so many media whereby man lays up for himself a record. 
and President Spencer W. Kimball has taught, there are dark, deep corners, locked rooms, isolated spots, but no act, good or bad, no thought, ugly or beautiful, ever escapes being seen or heard. Each one will make the imprint on the individual and be recorded to be met and paid for. Close quote. Think of it, our bodies as our own book of life. And to God, the spiritually in tune, our countenance says it all. Like an open book, our righteousness or wickedness can be discerned and read spiritually. Nothing is really done in private. Although not completely visible to the physical eye, holy beings can discern all of our private actions. And to more easily illustrate this point, let's take an extreme example. Think of someone you know whom you feel has become a truly holy person. Perhaps it's President or Sister Nelson. Maybe it's someone in your own ward or stake. And now imagine seeing that person standing side by side next to someone like, let's say, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Do you think you would discern a difference in the countenance between those individuals? When we receive the Holy Ghost, the effect it has on us is that it cleanses and burns out the dross from our souls. What we're noticing when we talk about someone who carries the Spirit with them is that their body and spirit are becoming cleaner, free from the markings of their own sins. And with reference to the sacrament prayer, we're witnessing the sanctifying of their souls. So next time you feel tempted to sin, remember that even if you sin in private, you will end up wearing and carrying that sin on your countenance until you sincerely repent. The last part of our highlight today comes from the end of chapter 3 and from chapter 5. Have you ever thought about what makes you confident? Really, what gives you confidence to go about your life from day to day? In fact, you might even push pause for a few seconds and really think it through. The Lord really lays it down in the end of chapter 3, speaking of His covenant children, so think members of His church. He said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and make a tinkling with their feet. Now let's unpack that verse for a second. Haughtiness, pride, arrogance, stretched forth necks, wanton eyes, those are flirtatious eyes, walking daintily. Now be careful with this next question not to place judgment, but does any of that sound like it could describe some people even in the church today? Now listen to what the Lord says about this kind of pride and arrogance, this backwards focus on, and way of life. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Then listen carefully to this next verse. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls and their round tires like the moon. Now let's stop there for just a second. The Lord is going to take away the bravery of these things. You see, apparently in Isaiah's day, and most certainly in our day, there are men and women who seek a sense of confidence, but they seek it in all the wrong places. Satan has found great counterfeits that give us a false sense of security and confidence. And I say this with sensitivity and respect, understanding that we do not always know why a person chooses certain actions and that it's not our place to judge others. But our society, even within the church, because as church members, we still live in the world and are influenced by its confused and tempting ways, has been plagued with products and procedures with fashion and filters that all promise to make us feel better about ourselves. They promise self-confidence, and who doesn't want to feel confident? But true and lasting confidence doesn't come from buying a fancy car or a giant home, the latest in decor or clothing fashion. It doesn't come with excessive makeup, jewelry, a trendy hairstyle or color, or through piercings or tattoos or surgical or other medical procedures decorating, marking up, or modifying the sacred gift of our physical body. And true confidence isn't achieved by using social media photo filters or jumping on the bandwagon with the next popular cause that storms across the media. True confidence is obtained by living a life of virtue. That is a life of high moral standards, let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly, 
then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. So it appears that prior to the Savior's second coming, the Lord will expose the temporary nature of all the worldly sources of confidence by taking them all away. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, the headbands, the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, the mantles, the wimples, the crisping pins, the glasses, the fine linen and hood and the veils. It shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be a stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. And burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Those who seek a sense of safety and confidence in the ways and popular trends of the world will be left empty-handed, and most significantly, When they go to stand in the presence of the Lord, they will be stripped of any sense of confidence they obtained through prideful focus on worldly trends. They will mourn, and they'll sit upon the ground. As the Book of Mormon prophet Nephi wrote, Others will Satan pacify, and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, All is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospereth, all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls, and leadeth them carefully away down to hell. So beware. Satan has become so good, he has almost convinced the world that he doesn't even exist. Nephi continued, And behold, others he flattereth away, and telleth them there is no hell. And he saith unto them, I am no devil, for there is none. And thus he whispereth in their ears, until he grasps them with his awful chains, from whence there is no deliverance. So Isaiah warns in chapter 5, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope. This means like an ox draws or pulls a wagon, the wicked pull behind them the burden of their sins, and they pull it along with a rope they seem too vain and prideful to let go of. And so the warning continues, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. It shouldn't be hard to strike up a conversation with that verse. What evils in the world no longer appear to be evil? What vices and wickedness have become commonplace? And how has God's work been slandered across the press? How is it mocked, ridiculed, and even called evil by conspiring men and women who seek to justify their own sins and fight against Almighty God? Elder David A. Bednar taught, Spiritually dangerous ideas and actions frequently can appear to be attractive, desirable, or pleasurable. Thus, in our contemporary world, each of us needs to be aware of beguiling bad that pretends to be good. As Isaiah warned, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In a paradoxical period, when violating the sanctity of human life is heralded as a right and chaos is described as liberty, how blessed we are to live in this latter-day dispensation when restored gospel light can shine brightly in our lives and help us to discern the adversary's dark deceptions and distractions. Elder Bednar continued, For they that are wise, and have received the truth, and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide, and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. So is repentance worth it? Absolutely. We can be made free from the burdens of sin we carry. Is there hope to make it through mortality without being tricked? Most definitely there is hope. We can be protected from the confusion and distractions that pull at our pride and seek to deceive us into thinking that right is wrong and wrong is right. The answer is Christ. As we turn to Him, He will make our scarlet sins as white as snow, and the Holy Ghost will be our guide and protector. I hope you've enjoyed this scripture highlight from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah really was a prophet for our time. Tomorrow, I'll join you again with another great highlight from the first few chapters of Isaiah. Have an excellent day, and remember, there is always hope in Christ.